This is going to be why real men love the Bible. Number one, men love the Bible because it's a sword. Something in a man loves weapons, and what better way for God to get a real man to love his word than to compare it to a weapon? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Psalms 149.6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand. Ephesians 6.17 says, And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The same way that David cut Goliath's head off with the sword is the same way we fight principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. The only difference is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're spiritual. And we fight the rulers of the darkness of this world with a King James 1611 Bible, not with the New International Version or the Revised Standard Version or the New King James Version. In the NIV, in Hebrews 4.12, it says the Word of God is alive and active. In the Message Bible, Hebrews 4.12 says, His powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel cutting through everything. But what in the world are they talking about, a surgeon's scalpel? If you have a King James Bible, you have a sharp two-edged sword that is quick and powerful. The devils aren't going to flinch when they see an NIV or an RSV or the Message Bible. The power is in the AV 1611 Bible, the King James Version. And the same words that Jesus used to defeat the devil is the same words I can read every day of my life. Gideon, who was part of the real 300 in the Bible, used the sword of the Lord and they killed 135,000. That's because numbers don't matter if God isn't on your team. You can have all the soldiers in the world, but if you don't have God, then you're not going to win. The Bible says if God be for us, who can be against us? And the church in Philadelphia had a little strength because they kept his word. They kept the word of God. And I'd rather hear a preacher or teacher who couldn't talk plain and stuttered, but actually preached the Bible, than I would rather hear somebody with just a great technique and delivery get up and say half a verse and then ramble on for 30 minutes. The power is in the words. It's not in stories or illustrations and jokes and long introductions. And I'm not saying we should be against those things, but the message without the words of God is missing what matters the most. And Jesus did tell parables, but it was to teach a Bible truth, and his parables were the words of God because he was God. And real men love the Bible because it's a sword, but not only this, real men love the Bible because of how it's written. If you have ever read the Bible, then you know it is written how a man would like to read a book. Man's sinful nature loves action movies and loves to see people get beat to death. Uh, the Bible has that, but it's in a context where you can be entertained by it and you won't be in the flesh. The Bible has some awesome words in it like smote. In Judges 15, 8, it says, And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. It has words like slew. Judges 15, 15 says, And he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And it also has phrases like wet my glittering spear, which wet means to sharpen. Deuteronomy 32, 41 says, If I wet my glittering spear and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. The Bible isn't a boring book and it isn't a sissy book. It does have a lot of violence, but men love violence. They just love it in a way that they shouldn't love it. They love watching gory horror movies that are pointless and love watching gory action movies that aren't going to help them spiritually. But if you really want to see someone get beat to death, then read about the fight between God and the devil. God beats up the devil all the way throughout the Bible. Satan falls so many times in the Bible. In Isaiah 27, 1, it says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. You see all these movies and shows about slaying dragons. It's all in the Bible because God slays the dragon. And they even have a hardcore rock band called Dragon Slayer. It's sad that a wicked rock band sounds more like God than these sissy, effeminate Christian rock bands like Hillsong, and Toby Mac and DC Talk and all that. 
And I love the way the story of Phineas is written. In Numbers 25, 7 and 8, it says, And now when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the men of Israel and into the tent and thrust both of them through the men of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So Phineas saved Israel because he thrust a javelin through some wicked witch. And how cool is that? That's where they get the idea for ding dong, the witch is dead, because everything in the Wizard of Oz was stole from the Bible. And that's what these movies do. They steal from the Bible and just make it sissy-like. But the Bible is written in such a way that you couldn't describe it any better if you tried. In Proverbs 23, 27, it says, For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Real men love for people to talk straight and forward, and that's what the Bible does. Like in verses Proverbs 27, 15, it says, A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. And how much more plain can it get? Can you describe a nag wife any better than Proverbs 27, 15? Every time some man whore flirts with my wife, Genesis 20 and verse 3 always comes to mind because I love how God said it best. It says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. That verse always pops in my mind when I find out another man is flirting with my wife. Uh, And God feels the same way about it that I feel. And I love the so called hate speech like of the Apostle no Paul. In Titus like 1, he made Satan from the lens out of one of themselves, even a prophet of the In Job 26, 13, it says, By liars, his spirit he garnished the heavens, bellies, his hand he hath says, formed the crooked serpent. True. Stuff is so easy for God that he writes it like it's nothing to him. And when Satan is defeated once and for all, it only gets one verse, and that's it. In Revelation 20 and verse 9, it says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It only got one verse because everything is so easy for God. And real men love the Bible because it's a sword, because of how it's written, and because of the one that wrote it. First uh, John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. If a man read about the real Jesus Christ in the King James Bible, then he would love the Bible. He is not like these contemporary songs describe him. My thinking about God and the Lord Jesus Christ is nothing like these Christian artists have in mind. I may take it too far the other way, but when I think of God, I see an angry face. When they see God, they see like the smiley face emoji with the halo around it. I know he loves me and he wants the best for me, but I know I'm unworthy and I fail every day. If you fear God, then you depart from evil. Men don't fear God because they see these sissy Hollywood type Jesuses and they hear about the contemporary Christian music Jesus. But real men think the Christian life is boring because they see pastors like Andy Stanley, Rob Bell, Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, and Joyce Meyer, who's probably more of a man than all those guys. And the devil knows who to put on TV. The real Jesus doesn't say the stuff like those guys say. The real Jesus says stuff like this in Matthew twenty three fifteen. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Matthew twenty three thirty three says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? In John eight forty four he said, Ye are of your father the devil. He said that to someone's face. In John 8, 55, he says, Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. So he called people liars and hypocrites to their face. He told people to go and sin no more. He got rough fishermen to be his disciples. He was a rough-looking man and was not beautiful to look at, as it says in Isaiah 53, 2. If he got some rough fishermen to be his disciples... Do you think they're going to follow some sissy? Jesus was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. 
He didn't have pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness like the Sodomites. But real men love the Bible because of the one that wrote it. And God wrote in tables of stone with his finger in Exodus 31, 18. Psalms 18, 10 says, And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yeah, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. And when he comes back at the second advent, it says in Micah 1, 7 and 8, and all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. For she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked, I will make a wailing like the dragons, and mourning as the owls. That's a scary sight seeing the Lord Jesus come back at the second advent because Jesus Christ isn't a sissy. The Bible says God is a consuming fire our god is a consuming fire and if real men read his words he will be like jeremiah said in chapter 20 and verse 9 it says but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones the way the bible describes god isn't like this sinful world will describe god in Zephaniah three seventeen, it says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Exodus fifteen three says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The God of the Bible is a God of wrath. And if you're not saved, then you are under the wrath of God. John three thirty six says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Hebrews 10.31 says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you're a sinner on the way to hell, it's a fearful thing to fall into his hands. If you're saved, then no man can pluck you out of his hands. And as a member of the body of Christ, you help make up his hand. But God is a consuming fire, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And the book of Proverbs says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. James says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You could end up in a bloody car accident tomorrow. You could die of a heart attack. You could kill over dead in your front yard. You don't know when you're going to kick the bucket. And if you die without God, you will end up in hell just like the rich man in Luke 16 who lifted up his eyes being in torments. But the same man that we've been talking about, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, although he is a manly man, he's not a sissy like they portray him on TV, he loved you more than anyone else, and he came down in the flesh and died on the cross for your sins. In 1 Corinthians 15.1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ came down to this earth, God manifest in the flesh, he lived a sinless life, and at the age of 33, he died on the cross to pay for the sins of every single man. He was buried, and then he rose again the third day. And if you will come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are, the Bible declares everyone as a sinner, as it says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says our righteousness is filthy rags in the sight of God. But if you'll come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and put your trust in what he did on the cross and rely on that alone to get you to heaven, then you can be saved and have eternal life. The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You don't just believe he existed in history. And that don't just believe that he died for people. You believe that he died for you and you put your faith in that and your, all your trust in that to save you. And that's how you get to heaven. You're not saved by good works. There's plenty of verses like Romans 4, 5 that says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. 
Your works don't count for righteousness. You can't live good enough to get to heaven. Jesus Christ did all the work for you. And if you'll put your faith in Him, then you can be saved and have eternal life.